my God, it's going to come back. It's going to go to our game. It's going to start to our game. We're going back down that way. And I'm going to tell you the 19th century story about why this thing is here in the first place, okay? So I go, all right? Yeah. 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 As you go back through this gate, watch your head, Lord. The, the roof does come down a little bit, okay? Guys, welcome back to part three. We've got another tour gate now. We're just going to tell you some more different stories. There's a big path going up there. I'm going to take you back from the 20th century right to the 19th century. Uh, the year itself is going to be 1835. Now, 1835, the Industrial Revolution is going on in Britain, and the thing that's fueling the Industrial Revolution is coal. Now, this part of the country is rich in coal. This is part of the Great Northern Coal Field. And there's people making an absolute fortune out of coal. That's not the people who are actually digging the stuff out of the ground, that's the people who own the mines, and they're the, also the people who are doing the trading in coal. In this part of the world, they're called the hostmen. They're the ones that's dealing in, in coal, buying coal from the mines and selling it on to large customers. So they're making a fortune out of this. So there's two gentlemen by the name of Mr. Porter, Mr. Latimer. And you can see all these fortunes being made out of coal, and they think they can do just the same. All they need is to find a piece of land where, which is suitable to have. There's bound to be coal underneath it. Sink the mine, bring the coal to the surface, and you, you make a fortune, just like everybody else has been doing. They can't get anywhere close to the river because all those, those collieries have been worked out. They eventually set on a place up at Spittle Tongues. Now, is it everybody local? Everybody, anybody not from Newcastle? Yeah. Well, Spittle Tongues is a place up in the northwest of Newcastle. It's on the edge of what is called Newcastle's Town Moor, which is a huge, big open space green space which is still there. Uh, the, it's called Spittle Tongues for a reason. It's uh, on the site of an old hospital and it's two tongues of land which was granted to the sisters and brothers of St Bartholomew to build their ho a hospital there for the incurables. Uh, and that was people with leprosy and it had to be built out with the town walls so it was kept away from the populace. So that hospital had long since closed down. Port and Latimer approached the brother, uh, the master and brethren and sisters of St Bartholomew and asked if they could purchase the piece of land so they could build their colliery. The brother, the master and the nuns actually said yes 
you can have the ground but will not sell it to you, we'll lease it to you for 30 years, providing we take a cut of all your profits. Port and Latin were quite happy with this, and the mine was built. The, the shaft is sunk, miners were employed, they find the coal seam, and out comes the coal. Great, we've got the coal to the surface, now all we've got to do is get it to the customers. Now you, it's a waste of time selling coal in the northeast of England because there's so much of this stuff, you're not going to get much money for it. Best place to get your coal to is London and the southeast of England. That's where people will pay the best price for coal. So in 1835, they've got to get down from Spittle Tongues to London. The only practical way you can do that is get it to the River Tyne and get it on a ship. Sailing ships, which are specially made for the purpose called Collier Brigs. Sailing ships, three-masted ships. They will sail down the River Tyne full of coal, go down the east coast, into the Thames, discharge your coal, and they'll come back with, and you make your fortune. Now your problem is with Spittle Tongues, it's about five miles north of the river. You've got to get it from the river, sorry, from Spittle Tongues down to the River Tyne. So Port and Latimer solved the problem by getting a team of horses and carts and taking the coal from Spittle Tongues right through the middle of Newcastle down to the river, River Tyne. Because you can't take it down the west side, which is the closest route, because the Tyne Bridge is in the way. Now, the Tyne Bridge isn't the one you see today, which is the one made in 1928. Uh, this was a stone bridge, a low stone arch bridge, nine arches. It had been there since the 1770s. It was called Milnes Bridge. It's on the site of where Newcastle Swing Bridge is today. But that meant tall masted ships, sailing ships, couldn't get past it. So anything west of that bridge was not navigable by shipping. So they had to go to the east. That's why they had to take their coal through the middle of Newcastle. Now part of the route on the, on, on the route to, to, the, to the river was Northumberland Street. Now Northumberland Street had just been built. It hadn't long been built. It was Cobble Street it was very fashionable. It wasn't, it, not like today where it's actually got full of shops like Fenix and Marks and Spencer's, Primark, people like that. This was a very fashionable street. And these were the people who had moved away from the quayside up to the fresh air of the countryside, as it was in those days, built their fine houses, and what's going to come past their doors 24 hours a day, 365 days a year? Coal carts. So these carts are coming across cobble streets, dust flying off them all over their clean washing and over the windows. Their drivers are shouting at each other and there's horses are leaving deposits all over the Northumberland streets and there's only so much you can put on your roses after all, isn't there? <laughs> so these people have got a lot of influence and they don't hesitate to use it. They call in the corporation and complain and complain about the noise and the dirt from the, all this, these coal carts coming past their door from Port and Latimer. The corporation respond to that by calling in Port and Latimer to a meeting and said, gentlemen, you must find another route for your coal. This can't go on. We're getting too many complaints. Port and Latimer are a bit shocked by this because this is their income. Nevertheless, they think, how are we going to, how are we going to solve this problem? And they hire a man called William Ellison Gillespie. Now, William Ellison Gillespie is a bit of a, he's a civil engineer. He's worked with the Stevensons, that's George and Robert Stevenson at the Stevensons Works, which is... Uh, the boiler room now uh, in Newcastle, which is the first purpose-built uh, locomotive uh, workshop in the world. He's worked with them. He's also a bit of an amateur geologist, and they employ him to solve the problem for them. So Gillespie's first solution is to say, well, I know I can't go west of Newcastle. I'll go east. Now, the route would make them go across Newcastle's town moor with a railway line or a wagon way. This would be wooden rails pulled by horses, it would be a longer stretch, but it would go across Newcastle's town moor, through Jesmond, and down to the Oosburn. Fair enough, sounds like a good idea, if a little bit long. He has to, but as he crosses the town moor, he must ask permission from the corporation. Because the corporation owns the moor, but it's a joint ownership. The council own the, the ground, but the freemen of Newcastle own the herbage. That means they've got the right to herd to feed their cattle, to graze their cattle on Newcastle's town moor. And they've had that right for hundreds and hundreds of years. And remember, the freemen used to run Newcastle before the Municipal Reform Act of 1835. 
So they ran it, so there was a joint ownership between the two. They both have to agree. The corporation were quite happy to allow this development to go ahead, but the Freeman said, no, you're not doing that. You're going to disturb the herbage with all this building and the trains are going to disturb the cattle's herbage. No. And they threw the plans out because they both had to agree. So Gillespie has to go away and think about it and what am I going to do about this to solve this problem? Well, I can't build my railway line on the surface. What about a tunnel? What about building it underground? Because canal technology had meant that when a canal was being built and it come across a hill, it could just they simply bore their way through it. They could take a tunnel, take the canal right through the hillside. Why not take the railway, the wagon way, from the colliery straight down to the River Tyne underground? Never been done in a town before. Plans go to the corporation. The corporation look at them and say, well, I haven't got a problem with that. Freeman, up to you. The Freeman said, well, it'll be a temporary disturbance while it's been built. But apart from that, it'll not disturb our herbage. We're quite happy for it to go ahead. So the plans are passed in 1838. In 1839, work starts. 200 men are involved in the project. We know that for a fact. We know that, and it's definitely a fact, because it was in the newspapers, so it must be true, mustn't it? Yeah? <laughs> because in January 1842, when the tunnel was finished, because it takes them two years and ten months to do it, and you think how long the Elizabeth Lane took to do, to do it, <laughs> two years and ten months it takes to do it, there was a notice in the Newcastle Courant of January 1842, and it said the 200 workmen involved in the building of the Spittletongs Wagonway Tunnel have had a party, and they've had a party celebration in the big market in Newcastle. And the big market, they went down there for the, to the Unicorn Inn public house where Mrs. Dixon regaled them with pies and strong ale for their entertainment. <laughs> two years and ten months and 200 men. How did they do it? Now, Gillespie was no mug. He was a, he was a geologist. I've seen he was an amateur geologist and he'd studied old maps and he knew that somewhere down here, the ice age had left boulder clay behind. When the ice had retreated, it had left boulder clay because it filled this valley in. There was a riverbed down here, pre-glacial times. All he has to do is dig down to find it, and there's his route down to the river. Okay? So now he has 200 men at his disposal. How is he going to make them work? Is he going to make them dig from one end all the way down to the river, to the river, or is he going to have two tunnels, which are hopefully going to meet up in the middle, but remember there's no GPS and tunnel boring <laughs> machines in those days. No, what Gillespie does is a lot more simple. He actually gets a horse and cart with a lot of flagpoles on the back. These flagpoles have got numbers on the top. He takes the first, as he takes the first cart, he takes the cart along the route on the surface, along with all his team of workmen. And he splits the team up into 10 teams of 20. The first team, he gets a pole and puts it in the ground just where you can see the colliery. He puts it into the ground and he says, right lads, I want you to dig straight down till you get to the depth it says on that flag. Once you get to that depth, stop. And then the team splits into two and one dig team will dig towards the next flag, another team will dig towards the colliery. And because they're just in line of sight, they just hang a plumb line down to see that they're going in the right direction. And every so often they'll pop up and just see that they're going the right way. So now you end up with a series of mini tunnels all linking up with each other. And you can also do it a lot, a lot faster. This tunnel though is not dug out by machines, it's dug out by hand, or should I say by foot. And we've got a picture a bit further down of the men who were at the coal face, so, so to speak. And that were the these were people called clear kickers. Now their job for 12 hours a day, fantastic job this must have been. They were the best paid, by the way. They sit on a bench at a 45 degree angle, and this has got a seat on it. This seat is adjustable to go from the roof down to the bottom, and that means as they sit on this uh, on this seat, attached to their boots is a shovel, and they literally kick and kick and kick the clear out. For 12 hours a day, six days a week. That clear drops to the surface. Then the rest of the, the team comes into action. These are the labourers. They take that clear away, pass from one to the other till it gets to the shaft. It's put in a big bucket. When it's full, that bucket goes up to the surface. And then about a day later, it comes back down. But this time, it's not clear and it, it's bricks. 
all that clay that we've taken away is now going to come back down as bricks. It goes to Nixon's Brickworks in the Haymarket in Newcastle, convert it into bricks and bring it all back down here. So we think we're good at recycling, but I'm afraid the Victorians were way ahead of us. <laughs> so all these things here have been made out of the Victoria Tunnel clay. Quite easy to dig through for, min for X miners and it holds its shape as well, so it can be lined out quite quickly. But if you actually look that way, I'll just ask you to move one side, you can see the tunnel isn't quite straight. You can see the bend to the right, mm -hmm. yeah? Once you go round that, we'll go down for a certain length of time and then we'll turn, come back on the route. Because what we reckon behind that, the reason for us turning right there is there's a boulder that's too big to be dug out. Now we could have used dynamite to blast it out the way, but that's quite dangerous in a small space like this. And we're not sure how it would affect the ground above us either. So Gillespie just goes around it and comes back onto the course a bit later on. Consequently, no one is killed during the construction of this tunnel, which was, for those days, was quite remarkable. There was a few minor injuries, but no one was actually killed during the construction. <coughs> now, what you've got, so you've got bricks on the roof, but the walls are not bricks. You see the walls are sandstone. Now, where's this stuff come from? Well, round about the same time this tunnel was being constructed, a man called Richard Granger, John Dobson, John Clayton, people like that, are reconstructing Newcastle Town Centre. They're moving it from the quayside higher up towards the Grays Monument areas now. That is a, a new town plan that's been put together by Richard Granger. His buildings are all sandstone, all sandstone faced. And Granger has finished with his project, just about finished his project. He has lots and lots of this stuff lying around in bits and pieces, piles all over Granger Town. Rumour has it, he come across uh, Gillespie and Granger meet and make, have a discussion and think. And Gillespie says, okay, okay, uh, Dickie, what are you going to do with all that spare sandstone, pal? Yeah. He says, well, I don't know what to do with it. It was either Avery or the Tain. <laughs> so he says, well, he says, wait a minute, Dickie, man. I'll tell you what, I'll take it off your hands, man. Buys a couple of paints and I'll take them. I'll get the lads to take it off your hands. No problem. I'll not even charge you. What do you think of that? <laughs> Fantastic. So down it comes in the shafts. Stonemasons put this in first, then they put a wooden arch up or a former and the bricks are laid on top till they're set and then the former is dropped and moved down, similar so that way. If you could take the Second World War floor away, you'd find that this tunnel would come to a point at the bottom because the shape of this tunnel is egg shaped. It's actually the point at the bottom, the point of the egg is below your feet and the round part of the egg is the roof. And you know how strong that is, an egg shape, if you take your egg out of the fridge and press it from top to bottom, it's a very, very strong shape. Press it from side to side, as what happened uh, down at Lime Square, and the, the, break, the sides break quite easily. So this is quite a strong, natural shape anyway, and that's what Gillespie does. Once the tunnel's all lined out, what's left to do now is the shafts. Now the shafts could be left open if this was going to be used by horses, or if it's going to be used by steam engines, or even people, but there's no need for that. We don't need that, so Gillespie fills them, but bricks them up from the inside, and backfills them from the surface. So there's only one way into this tunnel, that's at the colliery, and one way out. Because how, how is his wagon going to get through here? Well, Gillespie has done his homework, and that stream of running water you can see behind you is actually running towards the River Tyne, and that is no accident. There's a slope on this tunnel, from one end to the other, the drop is 222 feet. That's a 190 gradient. These wagons are going to come down by gravity. Why pay for something when you can get it for absolutely nothing? And that's exactly how Gillespie designs it. And before you ask me how they get back, I'll tell you that in the next part. <laughs>
Guys, I want to see us in the next part of the video. <laughs>